as we do this very radical thing of instead of pushing away challenging material but opening to it as an opportunity therein lies the basis of our freedom and the healing for ourselves and and really for our world so what we cultivate for ourselves becomes a profound gift for everyone around us awareness the final frontier these are the explorations of Jonathan Robinson and Brian Tom O'Connor. Their continuing mission, to discover fresh new paths to the mystery within, to seek out new joys and new methods of awakening, to boldly go into the heart of expanded consciousness. This is Awareness Explorers. Welcome again, Awareness Explorers. We're at it again. I'm your co-host, Jonathan Robinson, and I'm with my co-host, Brian Tom O'Connor. And how the heck are you? We're after an election, which we may have survived. How are you doing? I'm feeling very good. We had gorgeous, gorgeous weather this weekend here in New York City, and everybody was out um, either celebrating or commiserating, as the case may be. Right, right. Uh, I actually had uh, one of the hardest weeks of, of my the last 10 years this last week, which we can talk about with our guest explorer, which I'm excited to introduce in a moment. Uh, it had nothing to do with the election, it had to do with the relationship. But um, before I introduce Bruce Pardo, I do want to mention to our listeners that we do have a page on Patreon at patreon.com slash forward slash awareness explorers. And you can support our podcast for as little as a dollar a month. If you do that, you get a, a blog from us that talks about different issues and methods. If you send us $5 a month, you get one of or a couple of my CDs by iAwake Technologies called Beyond Story into Being and Shortcuts to Awakening. And if you're Really loving this, and um, you can support us at $10 a month and get my near-death meditation experience, which is probably my most popular product, and that's normally like 70 bucks. So please look at our Patreon page, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Awareness Explorers and see if that can work for you, and it certainly would help us to pay our bills. Anyways, enough with the commercials. Let me talk about our guest explorer, who I'm excited to have because he's a friend. He's been a mentor for me, and uh, his name is Bruce Pardo. Bruce's personal healing journey with complex trauma led him to develop something called the Heart Fluency Method, which is for engaging emotional wounds and afflictive patterns as a portal to well-being. For more than 40 years, he's been navigating and facilitating the path of inner healing. Uh, he's studied extensively in Asia in the traditions of Tibetan Buddhism and Advaita. Bruce is also trained in Feldenkrais, Awareness Through Movement, and Hakomi's Body-Centered Psychotherapy. His website is heartfluency.com. Well, welcome, Bruce. Good to have you on Awareness Explorers. It's so great to be here, Jonathan. Thanks so much for having me. What a delight. And how nice to get to meet you, Brian. Yes, thank you. You too, Bruce. In full disclosure, I should tell everybody that I just um, took the heart fluency class training, uh, which was excellent and has helped me this past week go through some difficult stuff. I'm wondering if you can just start off by saying a little bit about what you're trying to accomplish with heart fluency. Sure. I mean, basically, the class that you took was the emotional mastery training. And, you know, the, the purpose of that training, that's kind of our flagship offering. The purpose of that training is for you to embody and integrate a new orientation to your experience, especially to intense emotional experiences, whether they be old patterns or intense things arising in the moment. And to be able to drop into an orientation in the moment that where you're dropping out of the story into the direct aliveness of just feeling it and opening to it, but holding it in a way that's very highly supported, resourced, nourished. Um, and so that, that energy now that has 
been lit up in your in your system, you can be with at sort of an elemental level and not get distracted or carried away by stories. Um, we're not also uh, denying or suppressing the stories, but we're staying grounded in the body, but we're holding an orientation that not only includes the sensations as they're arising and passing and morphing and moving, but also includes a sense of our context, a sense of the space around us, which things in our bodies might be quite intense, but the space around us typically does not have that much of a charge. It's open. It is in balance. It is um, not pushed around by the intensity that we're feeling, but it's also not dissociated or disconnected from our experience. It is, uh, it's in direct contact with us. As a matter of fact, the space permeates us. So as we acknowledge at the basic elemental level, just the truth of what we're sensing, we also open up to how that's being held in the space. And that brings in these fundamental and actually unconditional qualities that are part of our of the of an inclusive attention, and mm -hmm. uh, that we don't have to generate or create; they're just there, they're given, and we don't step off of the intensity. We stay with the intensity, but we're also in this balance. So we've got we call this in heart fluency the healing orientation. Let's talk about that healing orientation no. because in awareness explorers we often talk about you know being aware of the background of awareness. Mm -hmm. Is the healing orientation the same or different than that? It is the same. It just gives a very direct and obvious way that we can, in a sense, feel. And we can feel this balance in our bodies between what we're experiencing and that background of awareness. Or in heart fluency, we use the idea of the space as mm -hmm. an initial entryway so that practitioners who have no meditation experience or, you know, course participants who have no prior spiritual practice experience can actually directly sense and feel into that space. And so as we hold this balance between, you know, whatever's arising and emerging and the sensations that are playing out in our bodies and this context of the space, it literally is. It's like learning a balance of riding a bike. You know? I agree. I, I've had a lot of experience with that this week. But uh, Brian, what you've read a lot about heart fluency. What comes to mind for you? Well, I really loved um, when you did talk about awareness on, on your website, and you said awareness is like the sky that holds and receives the clouds. And you said it's uh, unconditionally spacious, open and unstuck, still uncharged and peaceful patient and balanced, accepting and allowing. And I just find that dovetails so beautifully with, with, with what we talk about so much on this program, which is that there is something there that's already there, that is already allowing, that is spacious, that includes all of our experience. And it's kind of like the background to all of our experience. It is. And, you know, the, the, one of the things that I, I, it's such a profound metaphor and it's been used in Buddhism for thousands of years. One of the things that I find so profound about that metaphor, I remember a day I was lying, I was at college and I was lying out on the quad in the campus and the sky was completely clear and blue. And I was just lying there and looking up at it like, wow, what is that? And then all of a sudden there was a little wisp of a cloud that begin, began forming in an area of the sky, and then another one, and, another, and they, these little puffballs started emerging, and they built up, and then they're, you know, finally it turned into a rain cloud, and it started raining, and I just sort of let it rain on me, and then, but it was a very brief, and after a short while, about 15 minutes, and I'm just sort of sitting there gently soaked on a lovely May day in Maine, and uh, and then the clouds started to disperse, and they they started getting more thinner and more wispy, and then all of a sudden, at some point, there was the sky, blue and unblemished. Um, 
And so it's just, it's such a profound metaphor. Um, if I, it, because it's like all of our life experiences, all of our, you know, all of our thoughts, all of our bodily sensations, our sights, our sounds, our smells, our tastes are like clouds arising in the open space, the open sky of our attention, or if you could call it the awareness. And so the way that mindfulness is typically taught is that we're mindful of an object that leaves a person, you know, a meditator or a person a practitioner being mindful of the, the five senses and thoughts. And uh, when you then include, though, in the meditation, a sense of the sky that has all of these unconditional, ever-present qualities, spaciousness, unstuckness, allowing, accepting, non-judge, you know, you don't have to be non-judgmental. It's already receptive and non-judgmental. When you include a sense of that and feel into that, feel at the feelings, you know, level into that, now you take a me out of the equation and a duality collapses. Now you're in the non-dual world and all of these unconditional qualities are holding whatever this experience might be. And that experience might be trauma. And if you're holding a typical mindfulness to trauma, the attention can very easily collapse into it and not stay open. If you're including these qualities, they are profoundly nourishing and enable the attention to stay open even though it may feel strongly drawn and pulled into collapse. Well, that is one of the most beautiful descriptions of what I've always thought of as the missing piece of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Because uh, as opposed to being mindful of something, we're being mindful of that clear background, the ground of being in which all experience appears. And when you talk about um, that trauma can be like a cloud, maybe it's a quite a quite a, a storm cloud, a huge uh, meteorological event, but it sounds like you are shifting your identity from the cloud to the sky you know it's it's actually what you're doing you have an inclusive um, and so it's both sky and cloud so it's a, ah. so we never want to abandon or deny or actually do anything with the cloud we simply hold an orientation that is unconditional and highly supportive and then allow the cloud to do whatever it wants to do and i was noticing in a previous interview you were doing that sometimes when we make space for a cloud that has a lot of tension and intensity in it, the first thing that happens is that it expands into the space. It gets more intense in the initial moment of being held in that way. And that's actually a good thing. And and then we, but then from there, we don't have a job. There's zero job. It's all, am I, you know, am I in the healing orientation? And the other thing is we're just kind of monitoring, is it too much? You know, and if it's too much, then we have heart fluency has a lot of material about what to do if it's too much. Let me let me ask about that. <laughs> as, I, <laughs> as I mentioned, uh, this was the hardest week emotionally for me in the last 10 years due to somebody very important to me. The relationship might be changing. Mm-hmm. And um, and it came as somewhat of a surprise. So there was you know, all kinds of the most intense feelings, uh, anger, betrayal, grief, the whole nine yards was there. And to some extent still is. So um, I took your class. And one of the things I liked about your class was that it's almost like uh, uh, this ability you're talking about is really a skill, you know, like riding a bike, trying to get those two yeah. things together. You know the, the 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 sensation of your experience plus the uh, larger context awareness that it's in. Trying to put those two together is a is a balancing act, and um, I've been able to do that. And I like one of the reasons I liked your class so much was because you kind of drill people in that ability. 
you know, it's not like you just mention it. You actually do practice sessions of exercises of getting better at that, which was very helpful. Mm -hmm. But I found that I, with something this big, I wasn't able to do it most of the time because it was just too big, though there, it was almost like a funny struggle. I would try to be with the sensations and then the whole story would rise up in my head. And I'd say, no, back down. And it would rise up. It was like trying to keep a helium balloon, you know, on the <laughs> ground. So when, when something is too big and you can't quite maintain that balance of in trauma and awareness, what are some of the other tools that you suggest people do? So one of the things that, and, and this may be, you know, definitely too raw and sensitive. And I, I, uh, first of all, I'm sorry you had such an intense week, and you know, I, I feel for you. Um, in a way, there's a lot of opportunity with that, especially for this format. I'm wondering, Jonathan, if you would be willing to drop in with an aspect of the experience, and we could just kind of go live with it and and, sure. and through it. Sure, I think that would be good for our listeners. You know, the Lord works in mysterious ways, so I assume it happened so we could have this experience right now. Yeah. But, um, and also, it's not quite as intense now because um, right. uh, some developments might be going in a good way. So what I'd like to suggest is that, you know, I, I'd very much like to answer in detail your question about what do we do when it's too much. I don't know if that's going to come up as we drop in uh, with an aspect of this experience. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm happy to answer to that later, but just let's see what happens organically in the moment. And, you know, Jonathan, you mentioned several different emotional qualities that had emerged for you. Is there one that's maybe a little bit more predominant right now that feels like, you know, it might be? Uh, I'd say one sadness. To be sadness. Okay. Yeah. And I just want to, uh, you know, I'll, 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 I'll wait. I'll, I'll, let's, let's just go right into a demonstration um, mm -hmm. and just to, you know, and, and also into honoring, you know, what's alive for you. And this isn't just about, you know, doing a good interview or, or, or whatever, but let's really meet that sadness and uh, in its truth and, and, and its sincerity. Should I close but, my eyes? Yeah. So if you can close your eyes. And I will amend that sadness because as I started to drop in, I recognize that's really beneath the sadness is fear. Is fear. Okay, great. So let's touch in with the fear and just the initial thing to do. We've sort of stopped and recognized that there's fear there. And now we're going to drop down out of any stories or images, words or concepts into the direct aliveness of how initially this fear is reflected in your heart space, in your chest area, in the form of sensation. So noticing whether there might be any sense of heaviness or lightness, or hardness or softness, maybe a sense of temperature like a coolness or a warmth. And there might be a sense of movement like a contraction or expansion, pulsing, stabbing, tingling. What are you sensing in your heart space, Jonathan? Um, heaviness, some um, what I would call constrictive armoring. Mm -hmm. um, kind of like a bubbly feeling, which uh, I associate with the feeling of fear. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit of a tightening in my stomach. Um, and kind of like it's hard to breathe. Yeah. And just holding a wonderful clarity of your sensations and just being with that and uh, allowing your attention to stay connected wherever it feels drawn. You've kind of opened already and included your belly area. And just sort of allowing the attention to be with things just as they are without any um, agenda or preference, it's just a sense of sort of curiosity about what's happening. 
And as you stay connected to the sensations, also include, but don't hop off into just simply include as you stay connected with the sensations, a sense of the space around you. In the sense of it might be that you feel out, you know, maybe a foot around you or three feet or six or a whole room. Or I got it. Without yeah. distinction. Just feel that sense of the space, you know, the what you're feeling in your body has a lot of charge, but the space doesn't necessarily might have a subtle charge. It's just spacious, open, in balance, peaceful, not pushed around by what you're sensing, but not disconnected uh, either. It's in direct contact with you and it permeates you. Mm -hmm. These qualities are holding this experience. And how are you doing? Does this feel overwhelming? Or? Uh, it's on the edge, but it's not overwhelming. Okay. So just uh, uh, if it's on the edge, just uh, place a hand on your heart. And just feel the hand being on your heart. Feel your feet on the ground. Stay connected with the sensations and a sense of the space around you. And when it feels okay, just share with me what you're sensing, how you're doing. Well, the sensations sometimes change from what I might label as sadness or fear. Mm -hmm. um, and moving my attention around to like the feeling of warmth on my chest and my hand there helps or feeling my feet and kind of like it's like riding a bike if i focus too much on the sensations it can get overwhelming if i then back off and focus a little bit more on the space around me or the sensation of warmth of my hand and my heart it's more tolerable yeah and so there's just this inclusive attentiveness, and really we're looking for a balance almost uh, of like, you know, sort of 40% with the sensations and around 60% registering the space. But notice with that, there's a fair amount of attention that's still remaining with the sensations. And so we're not abandoning or bypassing. We're just supporting and nourishing, stabilizing. So that this intensity can be fully held and allowed. Okay, I think um, I'm going to come back. <laughs> if that's okay, that's that's fine. So getting a little bit too intense. No, no, I, I just have questions I want to ask. Um, okay. Well, and one of the things, Jonathan, as you do come back, uh, you know, just as your eyes open, allow them to drift around the room and connect with anything in the room that feels pleasant to you, that has a pleasant memory or association or is lovely, has a beautiful color, texture, shape. And just drink in those pleasant qualities for a moment. A nice breath in, really feeling your feet on the floor. Ah. <sighs> yeah, nice yawn. Nice yawn. Yeah. So please uh, tell me a little bit about your experience or your questions. Um, well, it's helpful and, and, you know, it is a little bit like riding a bike, finding that exact right balance. Mm -hmm. um, so, let me see what question that. You know, something that made this hard this last week, normally feelings kind of come and go. But I had pretty much the same fear, sadness, like there all the time. And it wasn't moving. Normally, you know, if I use heart fluency and, you know, I'm mad at something or or something comes up, you know, you sit with the sensations and it kind of moved through the sky. 
this wasn't moving. <laughs> you know, it was like, wow, that's there all the time. So after a while, I found that other things like going to the gym was useful just to move the energy or running, you know, uh, watching a movie. And I think that, what do you think, is that part of the emotional toolkit in a certain way that uh, can those things be part of how we deal with stuff? I think the emotional crisis toolkit that, you know, is one of the aspects of a training and something that I offer to people when we, you know, get together for, you know, just an initial introductory consultation about heart fluency. The emotional, the, the, the emotional crisis toolkit is really focused at, you know, sort of maintaining a balance of activation, right? And there are times when, you know, there's the idea of a lower and an upper threshold within which mm -hmm. our nervous system operates seamlessly, uh, uh, operates without effort. Um, so you're, you're trying to find that, uh, not too hot, not too cold, just right amount of, of sensation that you can handle in the space of awareness. Exactly. So if we're, so we call this the healing zone. And mm -hmm. if you're pop, like, like one of the things we were monitoring as you dropped in just now was the amount of intensity. So I started bringing in elements from of the deactivation protocol, a hand on your heart, feeling your feet on the ground. When you're feeling a lot of activation, the energy rushes upwards in your nervous system feeling your feet on the ground sort of draws it back down and helps to stabilize. Having a hand on your heart can stimulate the ventral vagal nerve and release the supportive nourishing hormones. Mm -hmm. uh, just actually stroking your breastbone. We could have worked with your um we could have worked with your breathing uh a little bit. That last piece about connecting visually with something when you open your eyes it opens up the sense of spaciousness of your awareness. Um, it orients you. And then as you connect with something pleasant, you're taking the amygdala and the alarm system of the brain and the nervous system offline and lighting up the pleasure aspect. So these are all things that can be done to help hold and maintain a balance because when you're over threshold, and by the way, Fight and flight, you know, a pretty intense activation can be within that threshold. And we want to learn how to ride that intensity. But if we just feel like, you know what, this is getting to be too much, it probably is too much. And that's when we want to, you know, stop, you know, we, we we're like, we're not abandoning what's happening, but it's in a sense, it's like, I need to be more nourished. I need to be more balanced. So I'm actually going to stop paying attention to the sensations and I'm going to go through this protocol and help deactivate and come back down into the healing zone and actually come all the way down, fully deactivate before having any sense of trying to re-engage whatever, you know, whatever in the moment is now present. Um, well, that's all making sense to me, but I took the class. How, uh, any questions come up to you, Brian? Well, I think this was a wonderful um, deep dive into it. And I was just wondering if we could zoom out a little bit uh, and talk about the, the three steps of heart fluency and kind of summarize them, the, uh, the stop, drop, and open. Right. So thanks. Um, as you will have noticed, I, I j before I do that, I just want to drop in one thing in regards to Jonathan's sure. question about what do you do with a fear or a sadness that just lasts and lasts and lasts. And so sometimes when we are popped over threshold, when we're really activated and a very deep core wound has been activated, then it's like, OK, a weather front has moved in. And what we simply want to do, what's that? Or, or hurricane. A hurricane, you know, whatever kind of weather event, you know, a volcanic eruption right, that's left right, a lot right. of ash in the sky or is continuing to go on. Um, you know, uh, when that happens, what's helpful is to recognize, oh, I am over threshold. You know, this weather front is here. 
and it's going to be here for as long as it's going to be here. I'm not going to be at war with it. I, you know, um, but I'm also not going to feed it. I'm not going to give it energy. And if I notice myself giving it energy, then I can do things, you know, which is basically fueled by um, attention or uh, believing the stories. It's fertile ground for lots of stories to pop out. And we get hooked by those stories again and again. And the practice is really just to come back and it's like, oh, I got hooked. Let me feel my feet on the ground. Let the stories go. It's okay that they came through. And uh, just to the best of my ability, let the weather front move through. The less that I feed it, the shorter its duration will be. And uh, and know that I will at some point come into the healing zone. And then I can adopt the healing orientation at that time. Um, so it really is. It's And so as you, when you are over threshold, then sure, and, and you know there's a, a significant weather front, it's not so much about getting away from it, but it's about riding that wave, you know, as, as smoothly as possible. And if exercise helps, if we do the exercise, it's like, you know what, I'm taking something that supports and nourishes me, great, then do it. But if you're doing the exercise to get rid of it or to push it away, it will only expand. What you what you resist persists and and actually amplifies. So it's very important your intention as you engage with these over threshold periods. And there's just going to be those times in our lives. I'm sorry to say, you know, to to break that news. Um, but it's a it's such an important piece because especially for us who are dealing with trauma. Those of us who are dealing, and you know, my journey, I absolutely found out when you're dealing with trauma, trauma has to know that it can be unconditionally supported, unconditionally held. And um, even it, to know that it's okay to be over threshold and to hold that over threshold time as skillfully as possible because actually really amazing things are happening when you're over threshold and not feeding it. Yeah. That's a yeah. very profound part of the journey for those of us healing trauma. Deep and you know, I hate to say this, but most of us are walking around with trauma, you know, being born coming out of the womb is traumatic. Yeah. So that's that's that little interjection and I'll go back to your stop, drop and open. Um and I'll I'll portray that just in the session that we did. So Basically, um, stop is simply recognize what's up. So, you know, when I asked Jonathan what's up for him, he's like, sadness, no wait, fear. Um, you know, that's kind of the stop step. When he dropped in, we drop in initially at the heart space. There is, and we drop out of stories and conceptual material into that direct aliveness of just sensations. It's a really rich vocabulary of our aliveness. I have a question about the sensations. There's, yeah, please. There's labeling the sensations with words like heavy, tight, uh, loose, whatever. And then there's just sensing the sensations. And there's two different things. Is there one that's preferred? So the, the labeling is simply there to help your attention connect with those direct alive elements. And, you know, after a while, um, and, and when you, get fluent uh, in the practice, you're not using the labeling so much. Mm -hmm. When we're, when I'm guiding you in a set or facilitating a session, I'm not guiding you. Um, when, when there's, when a session is being facilitated, we're using that rich vocabulary. You're using that rich vocabulary to share your experience. And as a facilitator, I'm, tracking that to make sure that your attention is connected with that immediate non-conceptual unmediated experience so that you're at the aliveness yeah i'm so not that, going into the story exactly <laughs> so the noting the noting is like you know just a whisper in the background until the noting isn't needed anymore and you feel stable and confident as a practitioner that right. i am connected in at the level of 
of sensations. And, you know, that's helpful. If a thought or an image comes through, if a spontaneous thought or image arises and comes through, that's fine. We're not in a war with thinking and conceptual material. It's, and when it's spontaneous, it is an immediate arising. It's not, we're not involved in an associative train or an interpretive train. What we want to do is stay grounded with the sensations and the sense of the space around us. And notice as that thought or image passes through, what kind of an impact, what, what shift might, uh, there be reflected in the sensations themselves? Did they shift or move in some way? Was there an impact at that direct aliveness, um, level? And so thank you for, thank you for asking that. I'll just get, go back to the stop, drop and open. It's really, you know, we, we stopped, we dropped in and we felt at that direct aliveness. And then you already, you opened in an, you, you said, oh, as you were describing your experience, we start at the heart because this is such an important center energetically in our physical form. And, uh, it is actually the seat of awareness of, uh, in, in our physical, in our physical form. Yeah, um, when you when you ask Tibetan Buddhists, I guess, uh, yes. where are you? They point to their heart. Whereas when you ask Westerners, where are you? They point to their head. Right. The mind is not in the head; it's in the heart for the yeah. for the Tibetans. And um, and so we start at the heart because that there are it is a, it is our awareness center, and there are all of these qualities. It's the center of our caring and connectedness. Um, so there's these very nourishing qualities that are already there, and that lends a resonance to the process that be as it begins to unfold. So we always start there in heart fluency, and then we open and we allow the attention to move wherever it feels drawn. So there's sort of an agendalessness now. The attention just moves to whatever feels predominant. And then the the last aspect is that that's when once we've connect, we've stopped, dropped, and opened, we also open to the space around us. And mm -hmm. we feel that sense of the space around us and its and then its qualities are brought online. And then something we I find interesting is that you know, I've studied in the last few years a bunch of body centered therapies, you know, Hakome, Feldenkrais, realization process, diamond approach, and a lot of an amazing amount of movement in the last 10 years, I would say, has been towards everything you've just been talking about. And I find that really interesting because, you know, you go back 20 years and this stuff was not, there were not books written about, they weren't popular. And I think the reason why they're gaining popularity is that they work, for one thing. And what made heart fluency different for me is that it was like, really helping people get good at the process, not just theoretically, you know, but almost like basketball drills. You know, you dribble, you know, do a dribble again until it becomes automatic. And I really like that aspect of it, that you, you kind of took a lot of stuff from a lot of different traditions, of course, Buddhism as well, and packaged it in a way that is very useful and practical to people. And Brian, you know, you obviously read a bunch on this stuff. What do you have any remaining questions in terms of anything Bruce has talked about? Well, one of the questions that I was going to ask, actually, Bruce, you ended up answering um, pretty completely in the in the sort of in the sort of sidebar before we got into the um, stop, drop, and open. And that question really was, what what are the specific mechanics of healing trauma so you actually did go into quite a lot of detail but is there one one thing that you find most important and obviously a, a side question to this you talk about gaining fluency fluency so this is something that happens over time this isn't a one a one-shot deal and it's gone it's, it's something that's sort of repeated yeah, it's like anything that we've ever learned to do. When I equate it to learning how to balance on a bike, you know, uh, it's very much like that process. You know, initially my dad 
held the bike and wheeled me around on it so I could feel what it was like to be on a moving bike. And that's kind of what happens in the sessions that we do as part of the emotional mastery training. But And then we repeat it. And, they, you know, now we can ride on our own with training wheels and then the training wheels come off and we can ride on flat surfaces. And then we start getting into some of the hills and valleys. And, you know, and by the time, you know, I moved out to California, I got a mountain bike and could ride down steep, rocky mountain trails. Mm -hmm. The same exact thing is the kind of embodied, integrated mastery that we want to have it so that we can befriend emotional intensity and also, one of the things I want to say, especially for trauma uh, survivors, for people working with trauma, I mean, A, it doesn't have to have come from some event in your life. Mine did not. I could not isolate a specific event from which my trauma arose. Um, Other so than being a human that. being, which is pretty traumatic in and of itself. Yeah, if you're sensitive, it's you, exactly. So I want to normalize that for those of you who feel really intensely. And I also want to normalize that portion of being over threshold for an extended period of time. It's actually okay. How you engage with that makes all the difference in the world. And I just want you to know, you will and you can heal. The qualities of your healing are already there. They're nothing that you have to create. You just become more intimate and familiar you you acknowledge and feel them more i mean at this point i definitely i walk around in life feeling the space around me and that collapses the duality of an inside and an outside and it's so profoundly nourishing so for trauma people just to know that your trauma as rugged and i bow to it um as it is that um, it is an extraordinary gift if you can work with it. And so we're here to support you. Beautiful. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's such a, you know, it, what it does is that challenging, intense experiences um, have a lot of uh, contraction and tension in them. They come into the healing orientation. They might spike and all of that. But as they unwind and go through their process and ultimately uh, relax and then integrate, we don't get rid of them. They bleed their energy into the stability of our healing orientation. So they become gifts. And, you know, experience that is skillful and helpful uh, is always expansive. So when it comes into the healing orientation, it illuminates the qualities of the sky that are already there. So whether we come to a point in our lives and our practice where whether it is something challenging or something beautiful, they are both gifts. And then that creates, that collapses a duality of experience there. And that's a really big thing because then we're not so much pushing and pulling in our lives, you know, uh, aversion and, and, um, wanting or craving we're more allowing whatever is to be there and it's a very different way of being uh so it, it's it's not unlike you know practicing anything with practice you get better and uh i got some good practices last week and continue to and when i see it in that context you know life is one big practice session to allow it to be the way it is and hopefully by the time we die, we, we've managed to do that. I'm wondering if you have any uh, last things to say before I hear you're going to be guiding us on a guided meditation. You know, I think that we've covered a lot. I just, uh, I, I think it's so important for people to know that, you know, you're already there. Everything you need is already resident within and without you. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, it's already a part of the of the structure. And so, you know, as we do this very radical thing of instead of pushing away challenging material, but opening to it as an opportunity, therein lies the basis of our of our freedom and the healing for ourselves and, and really for our world. So what we cultivate for ourselves becomes a profound gift uh, for for everyone around us. So thank you so much for having me on the show today. I'm delighted to be able to, you know, it's, it's so basic. It's so basic we overlooked it. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, and I hear you have a guided meditation for our listeners where they can maybe experience uh, a little morsel of this. And I do want to remind people that if you want to know more, you can go to Bruce's website, heartfluency.com, and he has a lot of stuff on that site, including how to contact him. But uh, let's let's uh, let's meditate. Absolutely, and just you know, for your listeners, I'm very happy to get in touch with you and 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 have a free initial consultation. So, if you'd like to do that, we can look at what's uh, specifically alive in your life. Um, and you know, we're in the holiday season here, so this can be a charged time in some ways. And you know, I think that sometimes we can judge ourselves. So, I want to work with an emotion today that you know, if it's too challenging, I invite you to. Just open your eyes, feel your feet on the ground, stroke your heart space, stroke your breastbone, connect with something pleasant in the room. And if it's okay, we'll just follow this. So just, you know, to support yourself uh, if it doesn't feel all right. But anyways, I'm going to invite you just to close your eyes and get nice and comfortable in your chair. If you have glasses on, it may feel supportive to take them off or it might feel just fine to leave them on. Mm -hmm. Just acknowledge yourself sitting in your chair, feeling your contact with the chair and just feeling being held, knowing that the chair is ultimately held through the building by the earth, this earth that has held you in every moment of your life and never, ever judged you. Just feel being held. And just breathe your attention in, feeling the sensations as the breath moves down through your sinuses and throat and chest and diaphragm all the way to your belly. You have a right to take up the space you inhabit. And feeling your feet on the ground and just touching in with the sensations that the soles of your feet, any sense of pressure, hardness, softness, coolness or warmth, maybe a tingling or aliveness. And with whatever you're sensing, just imagine that can extend down through the building you're in. Deep down into Mother Earth, rooting and grounding. And so now your attention is touched into these qualities of safety and acceptance and groundedness. It's able to be open to whatever might emerge in the space. And invite in because we can judge ourselves in the holidays. Sometimes there can be a sense of unworthiness. Very, very common. Almost ubiquitous. And this may be touching in with that sense of unworthiness. Invited in the word, maybe it brings up a memory, visualization of a moment of feeling unworthiness, or maybe just the word alone. And so allow your attention, we've stopped kind of with unworthiness, and now you want to drop into your heart space and feel, let go of the word unworthiness, and feel the direct aliveness. How that's maybe reflected in your heart space, any sense of heavy or light, hard or soft, some kind of temperature, cool or warm, some kind of movement, tightening, expanding. 
tingling, pulsing, flowing. After touching in with your heart space, just allowing the attention to open, move wherever it feels drawn in the rest of your body, feeling the sensation. There's no agenda here, it's just a sincerity of curiosity. As you do this, feel out into the space also around your body as you stay connected with the sensation. Allow yourself to really feel and acknowledge that space around your body. 60% of your attention on those qualities of openness, unstuckness, non-judgment, acceptance, intimacy, inclusion, receptivity, a balance and a peace, a stillness that cannot be harmed or pushed around by the intensity you might be feeling in your body. And so we hold this inclusive, open healing orientation and just allow what's happening for you to be fresh. If you find your mind thinking about it, just invite the attention back into the sensations, staying grounded in that, also including that sense of the space around you. Notice if what you're sensing, if there's a sense of liking it or disliking it. A sense of if there is, whether there's a wanting to get rid of it or push it away, kind of a, an aversion to it. Or maybe a wanting of more of it if it's pleasant, sort of a greed for it. If there's either a liking or disliking, just acknowledge that. And feel the sensations of that in addition to the base experience itself. Ease that out. And just with your attention, you don't have to do anything but allow your attention to distinguish those aspects. Holding this balance, sky and clouds, context and content. sensations in space. Can you be with this? If it's too much, hold your heart, feel your feet, open your eyes, connect with something pleasant, have a deep breath. And if it's not, just be with this Whatever the sensations, the aliveness, as they shift and move and morph. Maybe they get more intense for a little while. Maybe there's a sense of them relaxing, and the relaxation creates space for new material to come in. You just hold this healing orientation and there's nothing to do. Our only job is not to have the attention collapse. And so this is the balance. Feel the balance. Know that with practice you can hold this balance ultimately with anything, even up to and including the process of your dying. This is something you can do. And so with a sense of appreciation for the fact that, wow, there's a possibility to master my emotional world, supported by it. You just have a sense of if there's any good energy we've developed, any merit, we extend that out to all of life. 
we appreciate ourselves and our sincerity, we appreciate the possibility, the, the actuality of our healing. And we send out this wish to all beings everywhere of any kind, no matter what their leanings or orientation are, may all beings everywhere be truly, truly happy and know the gifts of our practice. What a gorgeous meditation. Thank you so much, Bruce. Oh. So, Bruce, is there anything that we didn't cover in this talk that you think our listeners ought to know about you and uh, and your programs and your philosophy? So one of the things is today we've been talking so much about the capacity for heart fluency to enable emotional wounds, uh, trauma, anxiety, afflictive emotional patterns, whatever, um, to heal naturally and, and easily. Um, at the same time, though, heart fluency is very much of an awakening practice, an awakening modality. As a matter of fact, it allows the attention to merge with that awakened nature. So the, the whole of the spiritual path of awakening you know, to what we already are can be described as periods of purification where there's healing of these emotional wounds of the, of the clouds that obscure the sky or the sun. Um, and then uh, periods where we experience directly uh, that awakened nature. Um, and so, we, you know, we definitely talk about heart fluency as a healing modality, but I think it's also important to emphasize that this is very much about connecting you with your ordinary awakened nature that's already there, not something you have to uh, create or or become, but simply, you know, uh, acknowledge, recognize, and really, ultimately, to feel. Well, I think that dovetails beautifully with um, what we're about on Awareness Explorers, and I think also what our listeners are, are interested in, certainly both healing and awakening. So I, I'm really glad you brought that up. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, Brian. And I'm so happy that our listeners, some of whom might have a problem finding awareness because they think of it as an object, your doorway into awareness of the space around our bodies, I think is so wonderful and useful. And uh, your image of holding the two together, content and context, is also invaluable. So thank you so much for that really been an honor and a pleasure to be with both of you and you know i hope it helps it's a great system and and very practical and how you uh teach it in a way that people can really use in daily life and i appreciate that and as we often tell our listeners during this uh, turbulent time make sure you take good care of yourself and keep exploring keep exploring Thank you for listening to Awareness Explorers. To learn more, you can check out our website at awarenessexplorers.com. Please subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast app. We'd love it if you would post a review. And please share our link on Facebook and with family and friends, because knowing yourself as awareness is the greatest gift you can give yourself or someone you love.